Hello and welcome to Spindle TV. My name is Lanny Shaughnessy and I'm going to be your host this evening. How you guys and girls doing tonight? Thanks for joining me, everybody that's jumped in. Uh, how awesome are you? Um, I need to make some quick adjustments, if you'll bear with me just a second. All right. Try to get rid of some of that blue haze. So how's everybody doing tonight? I figured what we would do tonight, because I haven't done one in a while, is a straight up Q&A uh, where you ask the questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and at the same time, we can uh, talk about the software and all that stuff. But whether it's a basic question or advanced question, I can demonstrate uh, an answer to you or explain an answer to you. Um, but we have a lot of new people that have joined that might be just beginning. They could be advanced. Uh, I don't know where what everybody's status is and everything in here. Uh, so, um, you know, I figured I would go through and be able to uh, answer questions for you all. Uh, if you have any with regardings to Vetric projects or anything like that. Um, one of the things that I have in the works right now is um, for... Mostly the people that are digital woodcarver owners, uh, I try to do something new or give them new enhancements and features and things uh, from time to time. And uh, if you are a digital woodcarver customer and you're watching right now, uh, there's going to be a new feature in the Planet CNC TNG motion controller software. Uh, one of the customers asked me if I do a live class on that particular software, but I didn't think it would be a good class to do on our Tuesday night because not everybody has Planet CNC TNG to control their CNC machines because not everybody that watches me is a Digital Wood Carver customer. Um, you know, so uh, what I've planned on doing is I'm going to be doing a live event in the Digital Wood Carver owners group on Facebook and we'll cover the Planet CNC TNG software for all the people that have that and then we'll also cover CNC USB controller for the folks that have that that, that haven't upgraded their software yet. So we're going to be doing that, and I'm going to be talking about a new enhancement in the Planet CNC TNG that I just finished an hour ago. Been working on for the last couple of days, uh, and it was inspired by another customer that had a problem and wanted to uh, figure out a solution. It's basically a tracing parameter, uh, so you can click a button in the software, and the machine will trace the perimeter of either your board or your tiling area if you're doing a tile job or it will actually trace the area of your project that is going to be carved for that particular file that you're running. It's called the trace procedure and uh, it's uh, if you've ever owned a vinyl cutter or a laser uh, that trace tool is very helpful when you're zeroing out things and you push the button it kind of shows you where it's going to be carving uh, and in this case we have that function as well now and then also we have our perimeter where it'll actually outline the perimeter of your board to make sure that you know you're in your carving area and stuff so some new features that you'll see uh coming up um i just finished coding it and everything and all that wonderful jazz so fun stuff for you guys and girls that own digital wood carvers uh and um for everyone else we are going to do some q a tonight and we're going to create a project uh, as we go uh, and um, answer some questions. So I hope there's some participation and um, we can uh, get into it that way. So the very first question is, can you explain, Laney, can you explain how the one-on-one -on -one, uh, training goes? So let's get over into uh, our other camera. Do, 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 do. I believe that is camera what camera is that today that's camera three okay and let's get me down in the bottom left corner Whoa. there we go cool beans all right so for those of you that are new that might not be aware um <coughs> i offer one-on-one -on -one training uh to subscribers uh, even to non-subscribers, uh, uh, being a non-subscriber, it's a little bit more expensive. It's about $45 an hour. But as a subscriber, 
uh, there is a fee of you know ten dollars a month that could change in the upcoming months and everything uh, but uh, right now it's ten dollars a month that gets you one hour of training one-on-one -on -one training with me each month that training session is video recorded uh, and you get a video of our session emailed to you at the end of it and then also I create two projects each month and you receive those two projects in your inbox and it's ten dollars a month for all that um, or there's an annual subscription it's hundred and ten dollars a year uh, for basically it's 12 months for the price of 11 and in the annual subscription you get 12 hours of training that you can use anytime that you want uh, in that 12 hours of training you could do you know two hours here three hours there one hour here whatever and you got 12 hours to use however you'd like you also get two projects a month uh, for a total of 24 projects for the year uh, and each one of those one-on-one -on -one sessions are video recorded. Uh, if you're interested in subscribing and becoming a uh, subscriber to get training, one-on-one -on -one training with me, um, you would go to the Digital Woodcarver website under Explore, go down to CNC Training, and when you get to the training page, you will scroll down to the bottom and you will see the training options. Uh, you will choose the option and uh, subscribe and uh, you'll get a confirmation email uh, for that uh, session with your schedule button so you can schedule appointments and you can schedule appointments anytime if the it'll show you a calendar if the dates open and the times open pick that date and time and I will initiate a call to you at that date and time to do your one-on-one -on -one training um, the uh, training is done uh, through team viewer remote assistance we're on the phone uh, actually I'm on my microphone here uh, because everything is getting recorded and uh, we are sharing screens so I'm walking it's like me being right there in your home or your shop with you walking you through uh, your your training and everything um, and so uh, that's kind of pretty much it we cover anything that you want to cover in your hour or two hour session or whatever you set up uh, it's the topics that you want to discuss the projects you want to go over and we go through them together and I help you uh, in any way that you need help so uh, that would be that uh, let's go back damage on vehicles is brutal um, let's see here so Chris I hope that answered your question and uh, oh Bruce hopefully the hell storms now a second folks I'm not sure why I'm buffering tonight because I got the quality turned down low. Hold on a second. Let me make sure that. I'm going to have to come up with a better way to stream. Uh, every way I've tried so far has been brutal. Oh my goodness, guys. Uh, every way I've tried to stream has been just absolutely brutal. I'm not sure. The stream quality turned down super low. So it's probably a little blurry to you guys and girls because I got it turned down low, but now I'm buffering. Man, brutal. Okay, we'll figure out that in a minute, but hopefully, Chris, that answers your question on the training, and hopefully y'all heard it with the buffering. All right, everybody, y'all hang out in the room for a minute. Y'all hang out in the room for a minute. I'm going to refresh really quick and uh, see if I can fix this just really quickly. Bear with me and hang tight.
Okay. Let's see if we can uh, build this up a little bit. And man, I don't know what it is, but hopefully that does not continue. It looks like it says excellent condition now. Uh, we will keep that up for a try. So I do apologize about the buffering, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I've done everything that I can. I mean, I've spent thousands of dollars on computers and all that, and I don't, I, I don't know what it is. I've got the highest speed internet that I could possibly get. Um, so this could be a uh, very interesting event. Let's go in and let's get some of these questions answered. Now I, have, I was caught up on questions, but now everybody's asking. Let's see here. Um, I look forward to learning, Laney. Uh, will you let us know ahead of time when you show the new TNG things? Yeah, Ronnie Probert. Uh, yeah, I always put a post up in the group uh, uh, announcing a live event. Uh, sometimes I just pop in last minute, but yes, I will be, um, I will be, uh, an, uh, giving you a heads up for sure. Uh, Frank, can the dimension tool be assigned to a level? So when you, when it comes to the dimension tool, I'm assuming when you are referring to assigning to a level, levels are in the modeling layer. Uh, now in layers, we have we can set our dimensions and we can assign our dimensions to a layer, the dimension layer, uh, so we can turn those dimensions on or off. Um, as far as the dimension tool for a level, uh, the modeling level, uh, I don't think so. I think it needs to be in a layer, not a level. And you might be saying, you might, Frank, you might be asking about a level because that's what you want to ask about. Or you might be thinking layer and saying level. I'm not sure, but uh, no. Uh, but you can set up dimensions in different layers um, in your dimension tool. You can assign them or place them on a layer so they can be turned on and off. Hopefully that's what you're inquiring about. Yeah, because that is uh, the only thing that you would be able to do. So you wouldn't be able to assign it to a level. Now, when it comes to the measuring tool, uh, you do have model cross sections so you can measure model cross sections when you're in that modeling tab that has those levels and everything but again it won't assign to a level the dimension tool that's a good question Frank uh, new one on me the one on training is a great investment you won't regret it thanks Deborah Morris I greatly appreciate that little kick out there um, Chris the training is hands-on so we are connected, our screens are connected. You are doing the work, I am instructing. So I'll take over your mouse and I'll walk you through whatever it is you need help with. Uh, and then uh, you will go, you'll turn around and I'll turn it back, the control back over to you. And you're gonna go through that process until you understand it. So we're gonna spend that hour with you working through a design with me guiding and pointing you in the right direction. Uh, if I have to take over your mouse to point to an icon or uh, something, like that, then I will do that. I'll say, okay, let me have your mouse for a moment, and uh, here's where you want to click. This is what you want to do, and I'll instruct you, and then I'll let you take back over and do that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's very much hands-on. You, you're not just sitting back and observing. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Jim, how are you doing from Midland, Wisconsin? Let's see here. Please explain the proper setting of Z on the machine and work tabs. Also, when using 10,000 inch uh, touchpad versus the quick set tool block, are you supposed to add 0.5 when touching off the Z? All right. So this question here uh, from Tim Bunton is referring to uh, our digital woodcarver touch plate versus our quick set zeroing tool. Uh, so Tim, the software, uh, when you're using the touch plate tool, the little flat 10,000 centimeter inch touch plate in your software, let's go over to that software really quickly. I'm gonna use mill mode. And in mill mode, there are two ways to 
zero out your Z with your touch plate. There's manually or automatic. Automatic, the automatic function uh, will bring the bit down. When it touches the sensor, it will raise it up to the original place that it started from and it will set the Z0 position uh, taking in account the thickness of that touch plate so you don't need to do anything with that. It's all automatic. Now that creates a work offset from your machine's absolute position to your work position because it's measuring the work height. Uh, so therefore you have to transition from machine tab to work tab to work in there. I'm a big advocate if you're using the touch plate of a manual touch off because if you're using the touch plate automatically, you could be while you're trying to fiddle with your computer to push buttons or what have you, you might have that touch plate not flat on the material and there could be a slight rise in it or curve or curl or something and it would come down and you wouldn't get an accurate touch off. If you're manually setting your Z with your pendant, you can slowly bring that bit down. It will stop automatically and then in your Z box, you double click on your numbers and you type in the thickness of the touch plate and hit enter. In this case, it would be 10 thousandths of an inch. Now, when it comes to the DWC quick set zeroing tool, it's all automatic. You do not have to type in 0.5 or anything like that because it is a three inch by three inch block by three quarter inch thick. But when it's sitting on the corner of that board from the top of your material to the top of the block, it is a half inch. All of that is automated. These red buttons up here across your software, uh, these red buttons across the top here, that's all automated. So the only time that you would type in the 0.5 is if you were doing a manual Z touch off with your quick set block where you're lowering it down uh, manually when it stops, you type in 0.5 in the Z. But there is a function that automatically does that. It's called set Z and it's automated. So you would not type in the 0.5. It's an, uh, completely automated. Uh, the second part of that question was, can you uh, explain the proper setting of Z on the machine and work tabs? Also when using the touch, blah, 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 work tabs. So that's in the Vetric software. That's completely different. Um, and now if you're talking work tab in the controller software, you have a machine tab and a work tab. I think that's what you're talking about. I don't think you're talking about tabs in a profile cut uh, because your question is mostly revolving around the touch plate. So in your Planet CNC TNG software, you have the machine's absolute position. You have the work's absolute position. Now, most people out there watching us tonight, their machines most likely have a homing procedure. When they power up their machine, that machine will run through a homing procedure and it will go to that machine's absolute home position. With the digital wood carver, you do not have a homing procedure. It is a variable home position, not a fixed. Variable meaning that when you clamp your material on your table, you are setting your X, Y, and Z home position uh, where your material is at, on each job. The machine tab is what you're working in in that case and you're always in the machine tab very rarely are you in the work tab so you would zero out the machine's absolute position on your material whether it's the center of the material or the corner and um, that would be your machine position the work position matches the machine position so there's no offset now what is the work position tab for it is for those machines that have a fixed home position because their home position may be in the lower corner of their, the front corner of their table, of their machine. When they go home, that machine goes to its original home position. But they may clamp their material out in the field. So the offset distance from their machine's home position to where they're starting on their board center or one of the corners, that is the work offset and therefore you would be in the work tab. Now most of those folks and anybody in here that has a fixed home position that works in Aspire, correct me if I am wrong in any way here, but most of those folks in their job setup in their Vetric, if they are not zeroing out right on their home position and they're putting their board out in the field, when they set their X and Y datum, 
they're most likely saying, okay, I'm gonna work from the bottom left corner of my table, but my work offset is over here and they're gonna put in an offset the distance from that home position over to that board. That's how I would do it if I had a fixed home position and things. If I had, if I wasn't clamping right on my home position, uh, I would need to know that offset. And I would set it there and account for it. So if you are working the Planet CNC TNG software and you are a digital wood carver, Tim, uh, then you stay in the machine tab and all you have to do is make sure that your work tab numbers match that machine tab. If they do not, there's a cool little button over here called work position offset to zero. Uh, and you click on that and it'll clear that work offset to make those two tabs match. But you stay in the machine position and you will be fine. Okay. All right, cool. All right, let's move on. Uh, and um, let's see here. When using spring-loaded diamond engraving tools, how do you set Z0 and how do you turn off the spindle? James, that's a great question. So a spring-loaded uh, diamond drag bit is typically designed with the spindle not running, okay? So if you have a water-cooled spindle, uh, typically for that tool, your spindle speed in your tool database do, 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 do. Let me get over to the tool database here. In that tool, in that diamond drag tool, and I don't think I have really one set up, but here's one that comes with the machine. Uh, you can set those RPMs to zero, right? Off. Uh, if you have a spindle. Now, if you have a router, you're going to want to make sure you turn the switch on the router off before you run that job. Now, one of the things is, is the job will raise up and it will move typically from its start position to where it's going to carve. And if you are fast enough and you don't want to turn your router off, you can simply turn the spindle button off in the software after you hit start and that'll shut down the router. I don't recommend that. Just turn the switch on the router off and you'll be fine. Uh, but you would typically not run the router with a diamond drag bit unless you want to dig in a little bit deeper. Like if you were cutting granite or marble, you may want to turn that router on a very low RPM to get a little bit of cutting action uh, to dig a little deeper. Um, but um, that just, it's, it's kind of a case by case basis. Uh, but how do you set the Z? Because of that spring loaded. Now there's two ways to do it. Um, there is a certain amount of spring uh, tension on there and uh, when you, if I set my Z pressure to uh, let's say um, a sixteenth of an inch, that means that I'm going to be coming down and it's going to put the pressure, it's going to go down a sixteenth of an inch past zero and it's going to put that pressure on that spring and that's going to be, you know, the pressure. I can set that pressure in the quick engraving toolpath in Vetric. I am a big advocate of setting the pressure at the machine. So in the quick engraving, you can set a depth of pressure here. So how much that bit is going to compress, you know, for that pressure when it's engraving. And you don't want too much pressure, especially if you're doing things like pane glass and stuff, because it could pop the glass. Um, but I'm a big advocate uh, with uh, the Digital Woodcarver spring-loaded uh, bit. Uh, I set a depth of pressure of zero. And at the machine, I literally bring the pressure down. There's a little indicator that when you when that spring is subtracted, that little indicator moves up in kind of this uh, little oblong bubble. Uh, and I like uh, about a quarter of that bubble. I like that little pin to be about a quarter of that bubble up, and that's how much pressure I like somewhere in that range. So I will bring the bit down till I get the right pressure, and I will zero out my Z at that point. And then if I, my depth and pressure in the software is set to zero, then that's going to be the pressure when it comes down to carve. I like manually setting my depth and uh, pressure. But again, you can do it automatically by uh, just putting it in the software. How much you want that spring to retract. And there's not a whole lot of movement, so it's going to be small numbers. You know, maybe uh, it could be 20 thousandths and 30 thousandths, you know, a sixteenth, so on and so forth, you know. So, um, but I, I manually bring down zero out my Z at that point, and then that is zero because I'm carving at zero with the quick engraving toolpath. 
All right. So hopefully that answers your question. Todd, um, yeah. On Todd Wise, as far as getting a clear picture, uh, anybody that's getting a fuzzy picture, uh, you have a little gear icon at the bottom of your viewing window. Click on that and see if it gives you an option to increase your stream quality. Uh, and you can increase the stream quality to clear up that picture. Okay, but it's only it's going to be based on your internet and all what quality uh, stream quality you can view in. So by default, it's like 430 uh, uh, px. Uh, you know, you can set it to 1080p or 720, uh, whatever options it gives you, and that should clear up the picture. All right, um, Jim Starnes, I hope that answers your question. Uh, but uh, you, if you have a router, turn the router off. If you have a spindle, set the RPMs to zero because zero is off, right? All right. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, Dell Francis says, on last week's owl clock, your owl eyes look great. Eyes appear to be machined out and there are rings around the eyes mine does not have them it appears that there is nothing to machine on mine all right so let's open up that design file do do do, do. okay on the owl clock and remember where if we uh, zoom in to this little guy this is the owl that we ended up using uh, the graphic we ended up using uh, for the owl and we're referring to uh, the eyes all the black areas in this photo are what's getting carved away all the white or lighter areas are your material so the eyes and everything are getting carved away here except for these little islands and things these little half moons and this little crescent and everything uh right here so if we look at the design here um if for some reason your eyes are getting carved out let's preview a toolpath here Now I've got it gray here just to show uh, in the color, just to show the difference. But in your carving, the files that were sent to you, uh, you should have um, you should have these here with everything else carved away. Let's turn that color off for a minute and uh, tilt this to the side so you can see the areas that are getting carved. So you should have these rised areas. Now if this was colored in let's say I was painting it black like the picture uh, and everything I should have that kind of uh, look there that I would you know had with the owl and everything okay um, so and it would uh, be representative of uh, what you see here all the black areas getting carved away so if you're not getting that, then there's a possibility that, that one of the vectors uh, that should be selected is not selected and it's carving opposite of what it should. Uh, make sure that in that carving that it is the outline around the feathers uh, that are getting carved and not the feathers themselves. That would be a reverse carving and therefore the eyes wouldn't uh, everything around the eyes would get milled away and the little black dots would be raised. So just make sure of that. Um, that is really uh, the only way I could see that those eyes would not be carving. 
if you're using the file that I put into the uh, the the chat section because it has the tool pass and it's the first four tool pass for this particular design here. And then there's a final profile cut that cuts out uh, the particular shape. Okay. So just make sure that you didn't accidentally forget to, or you accidentally didn't change, because if we look at the vectors that are to be selected, um, we want to uh, make sure that all of the vectors are selected except for the profile cut, that's for the profile, and make sure you don't accidentally have one that's not selected because then it would carve in complete reverse of what it should be. Check that out and see if that helps. Um, looking at the questions, um, How, uh, Mark says, how much is Planet CNC software? Does it only work for your machine? No, Planet CNC software uh, is uh, provided by planet-cnc.com. Uh, it is a motion controller software. They have two different control boards. Uh, well, they got three, but I'm talking about for the bigger units. Uh, they have a nine axis control board and a four axis control board. Uh, it is about uh, $300, uh, something like that. And it comes with the control board and the software, the Planet CNC TNG software. So you would replace your CNC's control board with the Planet CNC control board uh, and uh, run the Planet CNC software. So uh, a lot of people are still using Mach 3, which is kind of a pioneer that's been around for years and ages and everything. And you know, uh, Planet CNC TNG is stands for TNG stands for the next generation. So a little bit more versatile, a little bit more user-friendly, intuitive. You can write custom scripts uh, and things uh, for it. And uh, you you know people can also write add-ons for Mach 3. I'm not saying that you can't, uh, but it's just a little bit easier to control. I don't know anything about Mach 3 because that's before my time. Uh, and uh, uh, when um, we first, when Digital Wood Fire Carver first started, our machines were sold with Mach 3. Uh, but uh, shortly after that, uh, we transitioned over to Planet CNC because it's a much more versatile and user-friendly software, uh, and uh, it has a lot of uh, nice uh, attributes to it. One of the attributes, uh, let's open up a recent file here. Uh, one of the attributes is the view uh, and everything, the 3D view. And the hover, I like the hover. I can click on a certain spot in my design and it'll highlight that area in my design and I can right click and tell the, the router to move over to that location so I can start carving from there if I was trying to clean up something or uh, go back. There's a lot of features, uh, 3D digitizing and, and things like that. There's transformational matrix. Uh, if any of you are printers uh, and you have vinyl cutters, you know your vinyl cutters will uh, read these different uh, spots on your vinyl to make sure, and it'll transform the design to make sure that design cuts perfectly on that vinyl that's running through that vinyl cutter. Same thing with the CNC. Uh, I can uh, set four spots on my board, and if my board's not straight on my table, uh, I can run transformational matrix and it'll skew the design so it carves perfectly on my board even though my board wasn't square. Uh, some features and things like that I really like. And also, I really like the fact that you can write custom scripts. So uh, this is the script that I just ran for the trace procedure uh, and uh, this uh, code and all. And I can put that code into the program and I can add custom buttons to the software, uh, such as this trace button, this new button that uh, for the digital woodcarvers, uh, you don't have this one yet, you will soon. But I can, uh, you know, on this trace button and I can run that trace function. Now, while I have this design up, basically what the trace function does is um, 
I can tell it the size of my job. So let's, uh, let me scroll back up here. I forgot the size of the job that quickly. Um, and so this particular job is 14 by 10. My datum position is in the center, so that's one. And I have a choice if I wanna trace the perimeter of my board or my tile area if I'm doing a tile job, or if I wanna trace just the area that's getting carved. Let's say I wanna trace the area that's getting carved, that's set to number two, and then when I click OK, the router will raise up to a safe height, and then it is going to move around the area of the board that uh, is going to get carved. So it's gonna trace around that area showing the user where that particular part of the design is getting carved on the material. Um, if I were to, and then it returns back home and that's it. So it just shows you where it's carving uh, and everything. So um, if I wanted to run the trace procedure for the, um, again, 14 by 10 datum in the center and I wanted to run the perimeter of my board, uh, then the router will move out to the outer edge of the board and it will trace the perimeter of my board showing me where it is. So I can look to make sure that I'm clamped within my area or whatever the case may be, make sure I'm square, all that fun stuff, right? And everything. So. Uh, it will trace the perimeter of the board, then it will return back home. So that's going to be the trace function that uh, Digital Woodcarver owners are going to get uh, here in the next couple of days when I release it in the Digital Woodcarver owners group. Uh, and so uh, I like uh, Planet CNC TNG for the ability to easily and quickly write in functions uh, because I write all the codes for the different functions for the users of Digital Woodcarvers. Uh, and uh, I like the fact that I can create different tabs and different buttons that tell me information about my program and thing if I don't get that information in my G code uh, and stuff. Uh, it's really easy and user friendly. So that's enough about that. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, let's see here. Um, let me see. I'm trying to, you guys are having a conversation amongst yourselves. I'm trying to cycle out what's questions and what's answer. Uh, but no, Mark Kulig, the uh, software does not just work for uh, our machines. It's versatile to any CNC machine. Uh, so if you're a DIYer and want to build a CNC machine, I highly encourage the Planet CNC software. Planet-CNC.com. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um Okay. Um, hi, Lainey. Is it normal on the mini carver for the router to power on for a second when the power switch is turned on? Uh, well, your power switch uh, on your router stays on all the time. Uh, the software controls when that router turns on and turns off. Automatically turns on at the end of the, the beginning of the job, turns off at the end of the job. Uh, M3 and M5, that's the codes and the G codes that do that. Uh, you also have a way to manually turn it on and off your router uh, in the software. So um, your router switch always stays on and you, as long as your machine's running, it's in the on position and the software is controlling it. Now, because the software is controlling it, there's a little bit of a procedure when you're turning on your machine because we don't want to just turn on the machine without having the software connected and communicating with that machine controlling it. So you want to make sure that your USB cable is plugged in. You want to make sure that your software is open and you got a green light in the bottom right corner saying that, that green light indicates that it's communicating with your machine. Once those things are all systems go, then and only then you turn on your machine because we want that software controlling it. Now, if all of those things are true in your state and the router kicks on when it turns on, then that is something that with the relay that we need to look into and that's gonna be on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So you would call me and we would troubleshoot that. But I think if you follow the procedure, it shouldn't do that.
right? But if you have, if you turn on the machine before your software is connected, absolutely there's a good chance that that router could kick on until that software connects. So f go in the order. USB plugged in, software on and communicating, machine on. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a good question. With the vector validator, I am getting intersection alerts, but there are no intersections uh, and no double lines. All right. So let's go into the Vectric software for this one. And uh, let's close this. And do, 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 do. create a new file. Okay. The vector validator tool is a tool that will check for zero length spans. A zero length span is a uh, two nodes that are technically on top of each other, yet there's no line or span or curve or arc in between them. So the software will automatically remove those with the click of a button. It'll clear away those uh, those those icons and stuff. Um, but we have overlaps. Overlaps are when uh, lines are overlapping. Uh, technically, they're kind of intersecting with each other as well. But, you know, if I have a, uh, a duplicate, uh, that would be kind of considered an overlap uh, and things. And then you have intersections where lines come together. Now, in the question here, it says the vector validator, I am getting uh, intersection alerts, but there's no intersections or double lines. Well, that could be uh, very much a case of, and I don't know, uh, it, bear with me, I'm gonna see if I can try to, if I can kind of try to create an intersection. Let me offset this outward an eighth of an inch. Uh, let's do a trace bitmap. It's gonna be probably a little easier to create that. Let's trace what would be a good one to trace. Let's trace this anchor here. Um, let me get out of node editing real quickly. All right, on this anchor, let's go in here and uh, do a trace bitmap. Turn the fading off. Uh, I'm going to slide this up to 75. Uh, it's kind of my magic number. And I just want to trace the anchor. So default corner fit, noise filter. I'm going to turn the noise filter down a little bit and preview. Uh, this will typically occur with low quality images. I don't have any low quality images uh, very much, uh, but... Um, Let's see what we can come up with. Uh, ungroup this. Let me get rid of this little piece of trash right there. All right, so let's size this anchor up. Okay, let's do a vector validation on it and let's see if we get anything. So I have four overlaps and 28 intersections. All right, let's go look at the overlaps are identified by a box with an equal sign. So let's go look for those first. All right, so the box with the equal signs are going to be, let's see, yeah. They're going to be here where these lines, these little figure eights are. Now, technically, if I close this, uh, these figure eights are actually individual squares. They're not, it's not like a continuous line and they're not overlapping at all. But if we zoom in very closely, uh, there is a little bit of a touch there. So we're getting that intersection, right? Um, now, let's clean that up. And let's clean this one up. Let's come over here and We've got these, once again, this figure eight now, this figure eight is overlapping. It is a figure eight. Uh, it's not two boxes that are just together. Uh, this is not going to answer our question because of the simple fact, um, 
that those are in fact intersecting. I would have to look at your design because in some circles, in some lines, uh, we can create, let me show you this. Uh, I'll do it this way. Let's go to node editing. Let's come in here and cut this vector. And let's bring this vector and drag it. Oops. Let's drag it up here. Uh, let's zoom in. Let me get it perfectly in line. Bear with me a second here. Uh, give me a straight away there, Bob. Hold on a second. Let's go and make that a busy a curve. Let me pull this up here. Hold on. I'll create it. Ah, oh, you sucker. You sucker. All right, let me insert a point. Insert a point. And from that point, let me pull this over. Okay. All right, now, if I imported an SVG that uh, was a third-party model file, or a DXF or something like that, a lot of times those vectors are open and we have to close them. And sometimes a vector uh, can look closed uh, when we look at it here. But in fact, if we were to come in here and search this, okay, we have that intersection slash overlap, whatever it may be. But when I look at it here, and if I close that tool and I look at it here, you cannot see that. It is absolutely just not there, right? The only way that we would be able to identify that is to go into node editing and see these nodes that are close to one another and um, it's up here, but notice what my vector validator just did. Let's do that again. Okay. It put the equal sign down here. Okay. This equal sign representing the overlap is technically not right here. It is up here on the overlap that I just created, but it's showing here when there's nothing. This is just a straight line, right? So if I come and clean up this overlap, and connect that together, make sure it's joined. It is, I got one open vector somewhere. Select all open vectors. All right, let's join that. Okay, so with that vector closed, if we go back and search that with the vector validator again, I should have no overlaps. That overlap wasn't where the equal sign was. It was actually up higher, okay? Uh, so in your intersections, look for that. You're going to have to go into node editing mode and you're going to have to, you know, especially if it's one with lots of nodes and stuff, you know, it could be reading the node that's before it or after it, but that symbol could just be out there in no man's land. Uh, it got you close, but it's not exact. You know what I mean? And that is something you just have to work through. Okay, so hopefully that explains, hopefully that explains that for you. Um, and even though mine was an overlap, yours was an intersection, six and one half does another. If I would have created an intersection, I could have done the same thing, right? So it just, it wasn't, it was showing that overlap, but the overlap was actually way up here. It was up here, but the little equal sign was down here on that line, on that span, that particular span, it just came up on that span. So, and so that, uh, you know, um, a lot of times it's 
right on the money, you know, where it's at, but then you have those other times there, and you just got to get into note editing and dig through it. But I'll tell you what, uh, I am not a big fan of like digging too deep and cleaning up things. Uh, if I run a V carve simulation and everything is fine and I, you know, I say click continue, you know, to continue and everything is fine and it doesn't affect my design one iota, then it just stays there. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to sit there and try to pick out every intersection that can't be identified quickly and all that because these intersections here, I can identify those quickly. Right. And, uh, you know, I can go in and delete those square pixels and things like that. Uh, but if I'm digging and searching, you know, and things like that, and it's like, you know, I've got uh, 84 of them. Well, guess what? I've got 84 of them. I will go in and try my best to clean up. Uh, I can use the uh, the curve fit tool to help me redraw that vector to eliminate a lot of that. But I'm not, if it's not, I'll run a simulation toolpath and if it's not affecting my design, then it stays, right? So don't kill yourself on it too much, but you want to clean it up. You want a clean vector and all, but sometimes when you import things and stuff like that, it's, it's a brutal, it's brutal. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, high resolution images. And if I do have to buy a DXF or something on there, uh, I kind of dread it because sometimes I got a lot of cleanup to do. Sometimes I don't have any cleanup to do. All right, let's go through and um, uh, so hopefully, um, hopefully that makes your uh, answers your question, bud. All right, so Tim, you you came back with and and um, I'm gonna get to uh, I make wood crafts. I'm gonna get to your question here in just a second. Uh, but Tim, you said, uh, you, you followed back with a follow-up question. Um, so both machines and work tab Z's are set at the same, not at the 0 0.01 difference between them at a conflict uh, advice about this. Well, if it, they're wrong. So if I have 10 thousandths of an inch in my machine's absolute position, and 10 thousandths of an inch in my work offset position, I'm off by that 10 thousandths of an inch. If I have zero, if I say I set my Z to zero in my machine position and I set my work offset to 0 0.01, then I am off by that 10 thousandths of an inch. Now, if you want to do that, then that makes things a little bit more difficult for you, Tim, because what that means is, is you will set your X and Y's absolute machine position. You will touch off your Z, and when it sets your Z, and if you go into that work position, right now I'm at 0.05, let's say I come in here and I change this in the work position to 0.06, now, everything that I do from this point on, I am working with that work offset. So I need to be in the work tab for the remainder of this project. And for the digital wood carver owners, if you're a digital wood carver owner, you want to stay in the machine tab. You do not want an offset. So unfortunately, the advice you were given on that was not correct unless that person that gave you that advice has a machine with a fixed home position and they're working between their machine and their work tab and they're creating that offset on purpose because they're working off their work tab. Okay? All right. Other than that, clear out that offset so your work tab and your machine tab match. Okay? Cool. All right, let's see here. Um Can you make an 11 degree miter cut? on a straight edge or a curved edge instead of using a table saw. So any miter cuts uh, you can do in the Vetric software with a, uh, with a V-bit. Uh, now to do an 11 degree miter, you would need an 11 degree bit, uh, you know, 22 degree, 11 degree half angle uh, and everything. Uh, with a 45 degree miter, a 90 degree V-bit, uh, 30 degree cut, 60 degree V-bit, that kind of thing. 
Um, and basically, now the new software has a very cool tool path called the Chamfer Tool. Uh, and you can use that chamfer tool to create that miter cut, but you can also do it old school. Let's do it old school first, and then we'll use the chamfer tool. Let's delete that out of there. And uh, now I'm going to create a project, a sample side view board here, and we're going to uh, go uh, height of 0.75, and uh, the width will just go 10 inches. Okay. And let's take a line cut here and go 45 degrees. Let's snap, snap you boogers. Yeah. Hold on, let me get it to snap. Where are you at there? Work, 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 work with me. There we go, thank you very much. I don't know why it didn't snap, boom. All right, uh, you know, I could have used my tool over there to draw a 45 degree angle, but that's okay. All right, now, so, Let's uh, trim this away for a second, and let's draw a 90 degree V bit. Whoop. Uh, 90 uh, would be 45, 45, space bar. All right, now this cut is going to be done in three separate cuts, three separate passes. It's gonna take its first pass, at this depth, it's going to take its second pass at this depth and its third pass cutting all the way through. And of course I gotta, you know, do it accordingly. But it's gonna be broken down into three separate cuts. So um, what we need to know is what our um, offset distance is between those three cuts. And Let's come in here and draw our rectangle. So our rectangle here, let's say that my board uh, is, now this is not a side view, this is actually drawing it to create the tool pass. Um, I'm gonna draw a line here. Okay, space bar to finish. And I'm going to copy that line, Control C, Control V to copy and paste. And then I'm going to move that line relative to its current position, negative 0.25. Okay. Then I'm going to copy and paste, control C, control V, and I'll move that line negative 0.25. Oops. It would help if you control C, control V. There we go. And let's move that negative 0.25. And then finally, we'll do it one more time. Control C, Control V. That's just copy paste. You got buttons, you can do that too as well. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna move that one negative 0.25. Okay, these are gonna be my three tool paths. So I'm gonna do a profile cut on these three open vectors and my cut depth is going to be uh, 0.25 on this first cut here, okay? Um, from zero to 0.25 on this first cut. And it's gonna be on the um, on the uh, out, uh, wait, hold on. Let me see which way I drew my lines before I tell you a lie. I'm going to note editing. My start point's over here. So it's going to be on the inside of the line, inside left. Inside left. I know it's right, but it's inside left because my start point's at the top. Uh, so we're going to do inside left, and we're going to, you know, calculate that toolpath, right? Um, this will, let's turn this sideways a little bit. This will create that initial... Uh, first cut. Well, first, let's choose the correct bit, right? That would be helpful, wouldn't it? Uh, let's choose the 90 degree V bit. Uh, 90 degree, there we go. All right, awesome. And calculate that toolpath <clears throat> and preview that visible toolpath, right? All right, now my second toolpath here, uh, they're all going to be saved as one file, but the second toolpath is going to uh, again, be a profile cut, and this time it's going to start at a quarter and cut down a quarter. 
uh, and it's going to be on the inside of the line and calculate. That will cut <clears throat> that uh, next line. And then finally, my third line here will start at a half <clears throat> and cut down a quarter. Uh, and it'll be on that third line inside cut to create that third cut. And then I will do my profile cut, cutting all the way through my material. Uh, we'll use a quarter inch end mill for that. On the outside of the line, calculate. Oop. Okay, to create that mitered 45 degree corner. Um, now, that would apply to your 11 degree as well. <clears throat> okay. So you've got to determine at an 11 degree angle, which would be, uh, let's come in here, delete this. Let's draw a line straight down here and take our scissors and trim that away to start with a fresh new block of wood. And uh, let's go here to here is 90. 90 plus 11 is uh, 101, so 101 degrees. And um, I will just make the line length one inch and click add. All right, cool beans. And then I'll just trim away that excess and that there, and there is an 11 degree angle, right? Now, my 22 degree V bit with an 11 degree side angle would be the bit that would be used for this. So let's go 11 degrees. And so from 90 uh, minus 11, that would be 79. And let's come up here and uh, let's go 79. Let me zoom in on that one. There we go. Okay, cool beans. Now, we probably don't want to take the full depth of cut on this, right? So we want to take a certain pass depth. And at that pass depth here, that is where our, the, the offset measurement from here to here is where my line, that's the line distance on my three lines or two lines or four lines or six lines. However many lines that you're going to do to create your cut, I typically stick with three. Uh, three passes, uh, depending on how thick it is and stuff like that. I, can, I have no problem taking a quarter inch per pass with a V-bit. Um, so the offset distance from where the point of that bit is to up here, that offset angle, that measurement is how far I'm going to offset my three lines from one another, just like I did up above. And then I'm going to create that tool path at that pass depth. So I'll figure out what my pass depth is going to be quarter of an inch, let's say, uh, and, uh, I'll work on those three lines. So if we were to do this one, uh, let's get our let's get our bit up here at the top. Let's come down a quarter of an inch. So let's move it, move it relative to its current position down negative 0.25, and let's uh, move that over. I'm going to hold the alternate key to keep its plane there, so I know where that is. Uh, thank you very much. Perfect. All right, so that depth there, I'm gonna measure horizontally from, oh, I'm just off my line just a snag, bear with me a second. You better start snapping, boy. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna measure 
horizontally from this point to this intersection point here, and my offset is 0.0488. Okay, 0 0.0488, that's my magic number. So, delete these three lines. From this first line, I'm going to uh, control C, control V, and I'm gonna move that over relative to its current position, negative 0 0.0488. Uh, not a star sign, a negative sign there, Laney. Um, and then I will control C, control V on that one. Move that over, negative 0 0.0488, and do it again. Control C, control V, negative 0 0.0488, cool beans. All right, so on my first line uh, profile cut, we will change this. This time we will use a 22 degree V-bit. And uh, same cut depth, same inside of the line, all that happy jazz. Uh, and also uh, this will be our first line on the back, far back. Calculate that. Second tool path uh, will be cutting from a quarter to a quarter with the 22 degree V-bit. Calculate that. Oops, got to select a vector. Oh, hold on a second. I got to calculate my first one again real quick because I chose the wrong vector. No, that's the right vector. I chose the right vector, Lenny. All right. Number three, uh, going from a half to a quarter with the 22 degree V-bit and then we'll move on to the next questions. Ladies and gentlemen, select that. And that's gonna be line number three. Calculate, wonderful. Let's reset that preview. Preview the uh, all the toolpaths. <coughs> so that we can get that board, let it regenerate with that 11 degree cut on the end. That's old school, right? Now we have um, the new chamfer tool that creates that cut for us based on uh, you know our start depth, our bit, 22 degree V-bit. Okay, so automatically it sets it at an 11 degree angle. I can't, I can't change that. Okay, my cut depth, depending on what my cut depth is, the width of the cut will vary based on the cut depth. So if I'm going 0.75, I am going to be going uh, doing an inside cut sloping downward. Okay, and uh, we'll calculate that toolpath. And this one is creating that cut based on the one vector that I had selected. So let's back up to this vector here. Let's back up to this vector and recalculate this tool path. Arrows, by the way, are pointing the arrow, the tips of the arrows are pointing towards the deepest part of the cut, right? So let's calculate this on that line. So those move over. And, um, you can see they're right on the lines that I had there. How to do both ways. Cool. All right, hopefully that answered your question. All right, let's see here. And, uh, let's see here. Mark Coolidge asks, uh, do you have training videos on this software? If you're talking about the Planet CNC TNG software, they are sprinkled uh, between Spindle TV and Digital Wood Carver's website. 
our uh, YouTube channel, Digital Woodcarver, youtube.com forward slash Digital Woodcarver. Uh, but yes, uh, I have videos on how to install the software and other things, you know, how to use the quick set tool in the software uh, and uh, how to use the, uh, the warp feature with your digital probe and things like that. All right. Okay. I lose y'all. Are y'all still with me? Hey guys, are y'all still there? Okay. Uh, all I saw was Mwumi Cow about leaving the door open. I have no idea what that means, but we're gonna clear that out. But uh, I, I couldn't see anybody. Uh, I couldn't see any of you. Did 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 y'all get any of that stuff on the chamfer? Uh, the old school and the new school? Please let me know, cause y'all all disappeared for a moment. Uh, hey Mark, Lindsay, how you doing, bud? Thanks for popping in and joining us. Um, but tell me if you got all that information on the chamfer uh, and everything. All right, let's go back up here because I heard I saw some people saying good night, and I thought, did we leave? Um, let me go back up now that I can see all the questions again. Yeah, Stan Phillips, the trace tool would be helpful, uh, is going to be helpful to make sure that, you know, clamps and things aren't in the way, especially when you trace that particular carving area, uh, not the perimeter of your board. You're going to have clamps out there, but it will raise up to a safe height before it traces the perimeter or the carving area. But yeah, if somebody is uh, tracing, you know, carving something, uh, they and it traces that carving boundary, the maximum distance the router bit has to go in any four directions. Uh, you know, they could indicate if there's clamps or anything in the way. Uh, sometimes, yes, sometimes no, because designs, you know, even though that boundary is kind of based on a rectangle I'm carving in this area, that design could be just a little heart in that rectangle, right? And I'm only carving along here, so I still got dead space where a clamp could go and things like that. But still, it could help with that. So I'm hoping there's going to be a lot of useful features for it. Uh, I had a customer who really wanted that uh, a feature like that because she had it in her silhouette and things like that. Uh, her, you know, her vinyl cutting tools and stuff and laser. Um, and I thought, you know, why don't we have one for the CNC? So I spent last night making one. Um, 
And so, uh, Stan Phillips, thanks for that comment. Let's see here. Ah, oh, good, Chris. Uh, yeah, in the YouTube video description, the owl clock will be there. Uh, how do you set a toolpath for compression bits? Do you have to make a separate toolpath for each position on the bit, or uh, can you do it all in one shot? Okay, typically with a compression bit, you're typically going to carve it pretty much all in one shot. Um, and if you do do it in passes, your first pass has to exceed the upcut area of the uh, bit or else it's useless. You're using a compression bit mostly on plywood and things to get that nice clean mirror finish on both sides. And if your first pass doesn't exceed that uh, upcut area, then you're going to get that chipping that you're trying to avoid to begin with. So typically you're going to ramp into the cut. It could be a spiral ramp. It could be a straight ramp. It could be a lead in. I'm sorry, lead in, lead in. I keep saying ramp. You're going to lead into the cut uh, and uh, you're going to wait to make sure that you're, you got a ramp on your lead in that by the time it gets to your part, you're below that first pass. So uh, if we were doing a uh, profile cut here uh, and I don't have any compression bits I don't like them uh, but uh, we have customers that use them all the time and you know you one pass kind of deal uh, and, and all that wonderful jazz but um, I'm not a big fan of compression bits uh, but uh, so I don't have one in my tool database but let's pretend my quarter inch end mill is a compression bit I am going to be cutting through my material three quarters of an inch thick uh, and it's going to do it in three passes, but I need to edit my passes and I need uh, to my first pass. I need to make sure that it exceeds that upcut area. And I don't know what that distance is. I think usually it's like a quarter of an inch of the tip of the bit is the upcut. It may vary from vendor to vendor. Uh, so uh, I'm assuming that those vendors for compression bits, they have specs where the upcut is, or you can measure it yourself. But that first pass, um, you know, needs to exceed uh, that cut area to make it beneficial. And um, I'm going to apply that. And then I'm going to click OK. Uh, we'll cut on the outside of the line on this one. And then I want to ramp this cut. Uh, and I'm going to do a. Uh, a nice smooth ramp in so it's just going to come down and smoothly drop down to that cut uh, so I'll go with a half inch let's go three quarter ramp and then I want to do a lead in uh, and on that lead in I want to do a circular lead and I'm gonna go with a one inch radius uh, lead length at least my ramp length so uh it's got the lead length of 0.9 here uh or what it was at one point yeah 0.983 um i'll just go one inch and uh i don't necessarily need to do a lead out but it would not hurt to do a lead out uh so that when the bit raises up that up cut doesn't cause chipping on the way out. So I'd like to lead out on that. And the overcut distance, I'm going to have it overcut and lead out by a quarter of an inch. Oops, too many decimal points. And so when we calculate that cut, let's reset the preview here. So let's, uh, shoot. all right. So I am leading in to my cut and on that lead in, uh, it's going to lead in and it'll get down to that first pass. And when it's coming in to do the cut on my material, it's already pad that depth, past that depth and everything. So it's gonna lead in on that nice little lead in there. And um, on the exit, 
it's going to lead out and raise up. It's going to come over and start again. Exit and lead out, start up. And that will prevent the lead out, lead in, lead out. That will prevent that witness line that you get where the bit comes around, drops to the next step. Comes around, drops to the next step. Comes around, drops to the next step. Every time it drops the next step, you're getting those witness marks and that burn mark usually, you know, where you're coming down. Uh, the lead ins and lead outs help, you know, keep that away. So you'll, you're cutting past and out into waste area. And lead ins uh, could be on the inside of your material or on the outside. Um, but uh, that's going to prevent that. And so it'll lead into the cut. Uh, and then uh, when it's finished, it'll lead out. Uh, so we'll have that uh, there we go and let me see what I got going on here oh what did I do on my profile depth here oh 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 quarter inch in mill three quarters of an inch deep reset there we go Do I have something, bear with me a second. Do I have something trimmed? It's cutting a weird cut on the end here. Bear with me a second. Why is that? <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> my profile, oh, I'm still, I'm like, why in the hell is it doing that? I'm still got, I don't have my quarter inch end mill in there. I'm like, why is it still cutting a V cut in the end? That's weird. All right, let's go with our quarter inch end mill. I kept seeing that 0.25 thinking it was the quarter inch end mill. Uh, let me change that uh, cut depth there. Um, edit the number of passes. Uh, I'm gonna do a, uh, Let's go eighth inch per pass and, or we can do it in more passes. Let's go a uh, quarter inch per pass. My first pass is gonna be 0.3. Apply that. And then from there, We'll go there and uh, set those passes. And then my first pass is gonna be 0.3. Apply that. And, oops. Let me fix this, bear with me. Uh, 0.3. All right, bear with me. Set passes, there we go. Make sure you got the right pass selected. 0.3, click apply. There we go. Okay, calculate that bad boy. And some people like, you know, uh, depending on, you know, your cuts and all on your machine, you can, you can take uh, with a compression bit, you can take a nice single pass cut a lot of times on your plywood and stuff. You don't need to go multiple passes. I'm not an aggressive cutter, but um, you need a, you need to make sure your machine is pretty robust for that. All right, so hopefully that answers that question. So just set that first pass. You can edit your passes, set that first pass to exceed that cut. And then as far as the rest of it, you could do it all in one pass and all that stuff, but lead ins, lead outs and ramps help tremendously, right? Okay. Yeah, thanks man, great questions everybody. That is true, very good questions. All right, Moonacal. I don't know what Moonacal was doing, but anyway all right have you checked out the affinity software it's just like photoshop in fact you can read photoshop files infinity is a one-time payment uh save you some money so i use uh the adobe uh i have adobe cloud and everything so no i've never actually even heard of affinity 
But uh, thank you, Blue Knight, for that. I will definitely check into it because my uh, Adobe Creative Cloud is like $56 a month, you know? So we'll see what it does. But I, you know, I use, uh, you know, the uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, my Adobe Premiere for video editing and um, Lightroom for light editing and, and color editing and stuff. So um, I think it's Lightroom that I call it. Yeah, Lightroom uh, to adjust my uh, videos. And no, it's not Lightroom. It is. It is, hold on, it is the Adobe After Effects and yeah, just the Premiere and the After Effects. That's what it is. Lightroom is something different. That's, that's, um, what the hell is Lightroom? Lightroom is, photo I think it's photo lighting it's not video photo I don't know where you can do all kinds of cool graphics and stuff all right let's see I have to check that out thank you very much uh, one week on on the weekend did a V card but my clearance tool shredded the aura mask okay so if you're going to do a raised cut or a cut that has wide pockets okay um, and you're using Aura Mask, normally you would cut your pocket cut first, right? No. Uh, yes, you know, you would cut your pocket first in your V card. When you're using Aura Mask, run your V bit first. That'll do the V cut uh, areas and everything. And then before you run the pocket cut, peel the Aura Mask over the large areas that are going to get pocketed out, peel that off. Just peel those sheets off. There's no sense in that, you know, get, you know, your bit cutting into that and gumming it up and all that stuff. Uh, peel that off and then run your pocket cut. You're going to keep the aura mask on your letters and your design and all that. It'll stay there, but you actually run your V cut first before the pocket cut for the purpose of the aura mask because the end mill will tend to tear it and stuff and, and everything, uh, you know, especially in big wide pocket areas. So run your V bit first in that instance. All right, let's see here. Uh, I have a problem with tilt and fade. It causes pile up, increasing model size beyond my thickness. All right, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I'm gonna actually go into Vetric Aspire for that one. I think it, it may happen in all VCar Pro, Desktop, Aspire, and all that stuff. But I'm just going to open up a spire for that. Oh. Bear with me, guys. I got to get the aspire off my tablet. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, it was on my uh, my art tablet, uh, so I had to bring it over to the right screen. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and open up. Mm -mm -mm. Give it a minute. It's a large file. Oh, I don't want to open that one. That one's created with a 50%. Um, sorry, I'm canceling that out. I want to, that one's got, it's too high of a resolution for the stream. Uh, it's one of the models I created. Let me open up something different. Quickly, come on now. Uh, let's go to open an existing file. Actually, shit, let's just create a new file. Create a new file. Mm 
Okay, uh, let's create uh, a circle. Let's create a curve. Space bar. And let's create a little smaller circle. Let's go into node editing and cut that circle right here and cut it right here. Wonderful. Delete that bottom half. All right, let's go into our modeling tool. And on this shape here, we're going to create a curved profile. We'll go 30 degrees, uh, no base height, no limit, click apply. All right, cool beans. Start a new component. Let's go ahead and select this path here. And we're gonna use our single rail sweep, use that as our selection and use that little circle as our profile. And apply that. Cool beans. All right, now I am going to merge. I want that one to be a merge, not an apply. Or not an ad, sorry. Okay. Let's come into our 3D view. All right, cool beans. Okay. Let's say uh, that on this model, I want this to tilt up. I'll need to do some mirroring, right? Tilt and fading. Uh, so let's create this and let's go into the 3D view here. open up our properties and go with a tilt. Uh, we'll click here and here. And let's pull this up. Maybe not that extreme. All right, cool beans. All right, so the question is, is last week, and, or I'm sorry, uh, having a problem with tilt and fade causing pile up, increasing model size beyond my thickness, uh, using desktop so I don't have the gadget to remove waste below the model. Any thoughts on how to fix this? Uh, so there is no, uh, you know, on fixing that. Uh, basically, you can, um, what can you do in VCAR Pro? What are our options here? No. Uh, you may be able to slice that model. Um, let's create a model here. Import. I'm in Pro, so desktop and Pro would be about the same thing. Alrighty, let's uh, tilt this bad boy real quick. Okay, now you are either talking when you say pile up you are either referring to the meat underneath in order to get that tilted up to its size, or you're referring to the artifacts that go that get created below the zero plane. Um, and uh, in this case, no artifacts are created below the zero plane. And usually that occurs, those artifacts that I'm talking about occurs when you're using uh, Spire's um, uh, Aspire's sculpting tool. Couldn't think of the word sculpting. But if you're in desktop, most likely what you're experiencing is the meat that's underneath. And it's, you know, that tilt and all is causing your, you know, uh, you to exceed your height. Well, really the, uh, you know, kind of the main choices that you have is uh, to reduce your Z height. Therefore, you're sacrificing quality or you may be able to come in here and do a bit of model slicing, okay? 
So if I came in here and said, okay, I want my uh, slices to be, and let's say I want to remove uh, an eighth of an inch from the bottom of my part, right? Okay. So an eighth of an inch, I'm going to have five slices, right? Um, I'm going to come in here and slice that model. It slices from the bottom up. Okay. And so on that, let's turn off uh, the, the original model. So we've got our model here. And then we have, you know, slice number one is going to be that bottom piece. Right. Slice number two is going to be the part that's underneath that. Now, of course, can't do slice number two because I'm losing part of my model. But I can absolutely, if I turn off all of these, I can absolutely come in here and on slice one, that bottom eighth of an inch, I can just take it out of my model and only carve, you know, uh, the, the remaining pieces. And those... Uh, remaining slices uh, when I have them in here um, in my 3d finish tool path let's turn off slice number one okay normally you're creating your tool path slice by slice okay part by part uh, if I calculate this tool path Bear with me. Let's do that again. Uh, material is the, we'll use the model as the boundary, uh, blah, blah, blah. Let's calculate that. It should calculate it as one model, not the individual slices. If I want to do a sliced project, I have the ability to create a finished toolpath for each slice and everything. And therefore, you know, I can carve this but I've, I've taken off, I don't have that bottom slice, that eighth of an inch, I don't have it turned on. So I've removed that eighth of an inch of waste underneath, right? So that would be kind of a workaround if I was in Desktop or Pro and I had that problem, okay? So you still get your model uh, and everything. And make sure your model's in the right uh, position in your material and all that happy jazz and uh, you know, you'd still have that model. Now it's in slices. I could create uh, models for each slice uh, to do a slice kind of thing, but I'm not. I'm just creating my modeling toolpath. All I'm doing is I created the slices to turn off slice number one to get rid of that bottom eighth of an inch. <laughs> so that that would be the way I would do it in um, Desktop or Pro if I had a bunch of excess meat underneath. Um, that's how I would do that. Okay. Um, let's see here. All right, usually do three quarter and one inch boards, no problem. Tried to carve a three inch piece and uh, set file as normal using the 60 degree V bit. Only tried to carve down an eighth of an inch, but after zeroing out properly, the bit plunged about one inch. Dina and Glenn. So Dina, uh, your Z axis only has a certain Z height and you have what's called a home start position in your software. So in the Vetric software under material setup at the very top here, material setup, um, you have what's called a home start position down at the bottom. In that home start position, that means when you hit start in your program, this is what's going to happen. It's going to make sure that it's at X0, Y0. And in this case, it's going to raise the router up 0.8 before that router turns on. So in this case, it always does the Z first. So it's going to raise the router up 0.8 of an inch. It's going to make sure it's at home. If it's not, it's going to come home. Router's going to turn on. Then it's going to move over and start carving. Well, you only have from the top of your unit to the bottom of your router, generally your travel, you only have a certain Z height on your machine, whatever machine it is. Uh, in the digital woodcarver's case, it's a five inch Z height. So if I have a wasteboard on my table, well, three quarters of an inch, 
and I have a three quarter inch project board, that's already an inch and a half. And if I got an inch and a half of bit sticking out, I'm at three inches and I only have a five inch travel. That means I only have about two inches left, right? So uh, if I'm in a, let's say I have a waste board on my table, three quarters, and I have a three inch project board. I'm already at three and three quarters right now. And then I've got an inch of bit sticking out. That's four and a quarter. Uh, I only have a certain height. I only have three quarters left that I can raise up, but my Z is wanting to raise up 0.8. So I'm hitting the limit. As soon as I hit start right out of the gate, I'm hitting that limit. It's losing the Z steps and then it's coming down and carving deeper than it should, plunging that bit in. And if I exceed that depth too much, if I hit that limit too much, then all of those steps are getting plunged down through the board. So the thicker your material gets, the lower your Z gap above material goes. So if you're carving on three inch material or trying to carve on three inch material, uh, depending on your Z height, uh, your Z gap that you have, your, your safe travel, uh, you're gonna want this number to be low, possibly an eighth of an inch, something like that. When you hit start, you want the bit to raise up off the material, but not up high enough that it's gonna hit the limit, losing your Z, causing your bit to plunge. Okay, cool. Lower your Z, your, your start position and the material thickness. Recalculate your tool pass and you'll be good to go. Um, I use a separate last pass and with an allowance of 0.01 to get rid of those witness marks. Yeah, Mark Lindsay is absolutely right for those of you that are following the chat. Um, the separate last pass in a profile toolpath is very well as good, very good as well. Um, the separate last pass will, uh, depending on the allowance that you're giving, uh, from your outer perimeter line, it will cut out away from that perimeter, perimeter line for most of the passes. Let's say I'm doing uh, 12 passes. It's going to do 11 passes that little bit of distance away, whatever my allowance is. Usually, you know, a few thousands, whatever. Uh, and then on the very last pass, it's going to take the full cut. So you get that nice clean edge. It's removing very minimal material uh, and it removes those witness lines that you would get from where it goes around, down around, down, around, down, because it always drops in the same place when it's cutting those passes. All right, cool. So it's always making those, uh, those. Uh, it's always dropping at the same spot on those passes and everything. So thanks, Mark, that's awesome, yeah, that's good. Um, let's see here, 37 watching, only 21 thumbs up. Yeah, man, hit that thumbs up if y'all liking what's happening tonight. All right, let's see here. Um, Aggressive Arnold, when did you started making this? The video, the class, uh, 7.15 p.m. We're about to end in just a few minutes. Uh, so uh, we started at 7.15. Um, artifacts below the zero plane is an issue when I place two models on itself. Yeah. So uh, you want to, you know, hopefully, hopefully, Bob, that uh, that works for you. Hopefully that little slicing tip works for you. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tina and Glenn. I look forward to taking some one-on-one -on -one classes with you. Um, do you have any experience, uh, Mark Kulig, do you have any experience cutting metal or aluminum? Yes. Uh, not a whole lot of experience. Uh, but I have cut aluminum gears and parts and things like that. Uh, the uh, key trick is that because we're carving dry, uh, there's no moisture or liquid shooting out of our machines, you know, onto the material. Some people spray WD-40 on the spot when they're milling it out. I'm not a big fan of that because that shoots it all over the place, all over my wasteboard and things like that. And it's messy as all be it. Um, you want to take, uh, when it comes to non-ferrous metals, your aluminum, copper, brass, titanium, and bronze, you want to take, uh, have the appropriate bit, of course, but you want shallow pass steps, a very slow RPM, and you want to make sure that you absolutely look into chip load. Uh, so, uh, you know, get very familiar with the term chip load, uh, and uh, it doesn't, you know, it, it plays a role in all carving, wood, plastic, metal, you know, or non-ferrous metals and things like that, absolutely. 
Um, but when it comes to milling your non-ferrous metals and all, chip load is a big deal. Uh, it is the difference between breaking a bit or damaging something in your machine or ruining the part on and aluminum and stuff isn't cheap. Uh, so um, uh, you want to be uh, generally like, let's say I would be taking um, 30 thousandths a pass, maybe 3 sixteenths uh, per pass on, on a cut, uh, running my bit around uh, 10 to 12,000 RPMs. Uh, and things like that, but again, it, it varies from project to project and stuff, but um, you want shallow passes, slow RPMs, and the appropriate bit, metal cutting bit, uh, you know, uh, and, um, you know, more flutes isn't always necessarily a good thing, but typically you'll find in metal milling that you have, there are typically more flutes, um, except for uh, you can get zero flute aluminum cutting bits as well. Um, I'm not the expert on metal cutting uh, by any means, uh, but get very familiar with the term chip load and make sure that you kind of, uh, you can calculate chip load uh, and, and, and equate that to your machine if you have a hobby size unit, because most chip load calculators and feed rates and things like that are for those big industrial machines that can run four, five, six, seven hundred, a thousand inches per minute. Uh, you know, and if you're running only, you know, 100, 150, 200 inches a minute and things like that, uh, you can't run 450 inches a minute that it recommends for that chip load. So you have to do a little bit of the equation to kind of bring it down. And there's videos on there on, on how to kind of take what you get in your chip load calculators and, um, you know, kind of make it make sense for your end mills, right? Uh, reduce the flutes is one way. <laughs> so, um you know, if I'm uh, uh, reduce the flutes that, but I'm not the expert on that one, but yes, I do cut, I've cut metal and everything and uh, very slow, nice, easy pass steps, very low RPMs. Cause I don't, you know, uh, number one, I don't, I hate wasting money. And number two, I don't want to damage a bit and bits are expensive. Number three, I don't want to mess up my machine or anything. Um, Mark Kulig, no, not in this class. I can't explain chip load. Uh, we'll do that in another night. And uh, chip load is, I can give you a brief rundown, okay? So your, ro your router bit uh, has a certain rotation. And you are either traveling in a climb cut configuration or a conventional cut configuration. And chip load is the size of the chip that your flute your cutter is taking that is getting sheared off from the piece of wood. Uh, it could be a few thousandths of an inch. Uh, it could be larger. Um, and so if I were to pull up, give me a second here. Generally, you will see generic charts like this out there. Uh, chip load charts, uh, eighth inch diameter bit for hardwood. You're expecting to have a chip load between three thousands and five thousands, soft plywood and things and phenolic and all. And chip load is um, the, let's come into a good picture here. Oh, that's a small one. Bear with me. Let me find a, a decent sized graphic. Okay. So depending on your direction of cut and the rotation of your bit, uh, the size of the chip that the flute that your cutter is going to make, uh, generally, um, you know, if you are doing a, I believe that is a um, climb cut. Let me think about it here. That is a climb cut. It was there. Yeah, that is a climb cut. Sorry, <laughs> I had to cheat there for a minute. Uh, looking at that, uh, that is a climb cut, and so you're taking the largest chip, going to nothing on there, and sharing it away, uh, and you know throwing those chips out. Uh, that chip load is how big of a chip that each tooth is taking of your router. Uh, and as if you're cutting metal, you want to make sure you have the appropriate chip load. You don't want to be trying to gouge that bit in because you'll, you'll shear a bit in no time. 
uh, but there are calculators, okay? Uh, there are instructions, there's uh, explanations, basically the thickness of material sheared away by each cutting tooth is called a feed per tooth or a chip load, right? Uh, the chip load carries away with it a uh, your if you got nice chips and you're not making fine sawdust, you know if you're making nice chips on your wood, those chips when they fly away, heat is getting dispelled away from the bit, um, uh, and uh, it's keeping that bit cooler while it's running. Uh, if you're not getting nice chips flying off and you're getting just fine particles of dust and powder then heat is not getting taken away from that bit and that heat is that bit is heating up and heat is what kills a dull bit, right? Um, and um, the number of teeth on a tool can be very important, which we just uh, said, you know, the number of flutes and uh, the wrong speeds and feeds and flutes can be, can cause those chips to clog. It can cause tools to overheat, poor cutting, breakage, all that stuff. All right, cool. Uh, so, the, the this in itself is a whole class in itself um and but uh you can do just google it chip load cool all right let's see here thanks michael keepman uh uh thanks michael keepmont for jumping in and answering that as well um Fozzie, Fozzie Bear, uh, the chip load, uh, depending on the number of flutes, again, that's the size that's taken off, it varies by the type of material, number of flutes, okay? So your, to calculate your chip load, okay, let me see if you see this, all right, to calculate your chip load, it's your feed rate in, inches a minute, millimeters a minute, whatever, um, divided by your RPMs times the number of flutes, okay? Um, so your RPMs times the number of flutes divided by your, or your feed rate divided by that, that will tell you the size of the chip load that you're taking. So chip load, you could get, you could be making fine dust, you could be making uh, small chips, and it all depends on how fast you're running, how many flutes that router bit has on it, how fast that bit is spinning. All of those things equate to chip load. All right? Okay. Cool. Um, do you have any laser carvings? If so, what machine do you recommend? Uh, well, I recommend the digital wood laser. Uh, we have a 60 watt and a 90 watt laser machine, digitalwoodcarver.com, and we also have a six watt laser uh, that connects us, that connects to your CNC machine. Um, but uh, the uh, you know, if you're looking for an actual laser machine, 60 or 90 watt, we sell them at digitalwoodcarver.com. We have a 60 and a 90 watt. Uh, the 60 is a 20. 26 by oh lord hold on a second <clears throat> uh 26 by or 24 by 16 uh 60 watt laser 5400 dollars and a 36 by 24 90 watt laser around 8500 Okie dokie. All right. Yep, Michael Kemont, uh, in your tool database here. Uh, am I pronouncing that right, by the way, Kemont? Okay. Uh, in your tool database, ladies and gentlemen, version, uh, I think it started in version 10, maybe 9.5. But when you have, if you've got your tool set up, uh, properly, let me find my quarter inch in mill here. Um, if you have your flutes in and you've got your parameter set up and all that stuff, it will tell you the chip load that you're running. Uh, it'll kind of give you an idea what your chip load is for that bit based on your settings and parameters. Okay. Okie dokie, dokie, dokie. 
in the tool database. So, all right. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, it's 9-11. We're going to wrap up in uh, three minutes. I Hopefully, you found in uh, some of these questions. They were great questions tonight, by the way. Thanks for doing that, guys and girls. It always makes it easier to participate. Um, but... Uh, um, we're at uh, we're gonna finish up right at two hours seven fifteen nine fifteen yeah let's finish it up at two hours here. Uh, hopefully you found that interesting. I do these Q and A's where it's just Q and A. We're not doing a design. I probably try I try to get them in once a month at least one class a month uh, for this. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and got some information out of it. Uh, and uh, we'll be back next week with an actual project design and stuff. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thanks for participating and asking questions. Otherwise, it would have just been us staring at each other. <laughs> no, I would have come up with something. Um, but uh, uh, Darwin Bolvin uh, is asking the last question. How to put a router bit in the router the same depth each time? Well, there's a lot of tips and tricks for that, okay? Uh, so number one, um, your router bit and your collet, um, when you put your bit in, uh, the shank of the bit, that tip of the bit, cutters down here, okay? Uh, you want to make sure that the tip of the bit is not exceeding the top of the collet or flush with it. You want it about a uh, 16th to an eighth away from going, you know, being flush with the top of your collet because we need that top of that collet to be able to grip the top of that bit. If you go past the collet, then it can't close properly and it's only really gripping on the bottom part of that collet on the bit. And that could cause bit run out and things. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure we don't go too far in past our collet. Uh, we want to be about an eighth to sixteenth of an inch away uh, from you know being flush with it. We want to be down a little bit. Uh, and one way to do that, people will uh, they'll mark their bits. Uh, they'll they'll look at their collet and everything, and they'll take a little sharpie and they'll mark their bits. Uh, some people will actually take little rubber O rings. Uh, black those little black rubber o-rings uh, little small ones and they'll put them in uh, Right where the, it needs to be so that when they put their bit up their bit goes right up to the o-ring and they tighten it on Those o-rings will stay on there. They won't fly off typically um, You know companies like precisebits.com and stuff They sell their bits with a ring in there already set to the ideal height that should go in uh, and things like that, but little rubber O-rings. I, I just use a Sharpie and I mark my bits and everything. Uh, some bits, actually the manufacturers on some of them, Amana I think does it. Uh, I'd have to look at one of my Amana bits, but they actually have a mark on their bit where it's the recommended where the bit should go to, you know, in your collet and everything um, and stuff. But uh, yeah, so uh, just know that when you put it in, you want to be just just a little shy under the uh, being flush with the top of that collet, so that top and bottom can grip properly. Uh, and once you get that setting and everything, you can put a little rubber O-ring there and make a mark, and now you can put it in every time at the same time. Uh, okay. Yep, Blue Knight says you could use a locking collar on the bit. Uh, that's a way to as well. Um, is that the, you, when you're referring to the locking collar, you're talking about like uh, the like you would see on drill bits for pass steps and stuff that's got the little set screw? You ever had a, uh, I would use a, definitely use like a blue Loctite on that set screw. That bit's spinning pretty fast. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that would be a, that would be a good way too. Um, yeah. Yep, Michael's machine does uh, measure the bit every time you do tool changes uh, and all that good stuff. So cool. All right, everybody, it's 9.15. We're going to close out right now. Thank you for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. Y'all have a wonderful night. And until next time, I'll see you soon. See you next week.